we have an hour, right? Yes. Yeah, and give and take, um, you know, whatever your time allows you to have. Okay. I'd love to have some co comments and questions afterwards. That, if you that's uh, that's dangerous. You don't, okay. you don't say that to me. No, it's going to be about an hour. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, welcome everyone to our very first Conservation Colloquy and Wildlife Wednesday. I'm Elitris Niels. I'm the Executive Director of Conservation Catalyst. And this is our very first ever Conservation Colloquy. And when we were planning this event, we wanted to start it off right. And so we thought about who we wanted in our very first speaker. We wanted someone who was a world-class scientist and that did interdisciplinary work and even transdisciplinary work. Uh, we wanted someone who was doing research that was relevant today. Um, and we also wanted someone who is really charismatic and fun to listen to. And the very first person that came to mind was Rodrigo. And um, he is all of these things and more, as you will see. Um, Rodrigo is, um, I'm sure all of you have read his bio, but um, just to remind you, um, he works on the conservation of mammals and he works on everything, um, you know, huge diversity of species with fur, um, everything from jaguars to bats. Um, so he doesn't just stick with terrestrial animals. Um, he is a senior professor at the Institute of Ecology uh, at UNAM. Um, he is the co-chair of the CITES Animal Committee and he, the IUCN Bat Specialist Group. And Rodrigo has won just a plethora of awards. He's the Rolex Award Laureate, um, the Whitley Gold Award winner, and he has hundreds of publications, and he was even recently the seventh ever explorer at large um, for the National Geographic Society. And so we are really, really fortunate to have him with us today. And so if you could please just kind of join me in smiling, giving um, you know, some sort of attention to Rodrigo joining us from Mexico. Um, we are very excited to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm sure that from this talk, uh, some collaborations may stem. I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to engaging your group of conservation catalysts. And uh, uh, without any further uh, preamble, let's jump in. And I am going to share my screen. Oops, you have to let me share the screen, Alitris, please. You should be able to. I, 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 okay, I can do it now. Okay. All right. So, uh, Alitris, for whatever reason, uh -huh. uh, in the recent Zoom sessions, I, uh, when, I, when I advance to the next slide, the thing doesn't show the next slide. So please interrupt me if at some point uh, the slides are not advancing, all right? Okay, so you are all seeing my first slide, right? Yes. Okay, so <laughs> I thought that we could uh, spend a little bit of time uh, looking over uh, three examples of things that we have been able to do my career has always been focused on doing research with the uh, determination of uh, making this research available and not only available but implementing it in 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 policy in public policy at the uh, uh, at the federal level at the international level I work in fourteen countries in four continents so but these three cases are uh, are for, from Mexico. So the next slide, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I can't even advance it myself there. Okay, so, so these are the three examples, the jaguar, the bighorn sheep, and the no, long-nosed bat. So, uh, so we're going to start with jaguars. And when you listen, when you hear the word jaguar, uh, immediately, your brain already knows and processes the concept of a jaguar as a trans representation of power and superiority. It's transcultural and transtemporal. For example, 
if a Leatrice goes by in her Jaguar car, you know that there is a very powerful person driving by because she is driving a Jaguar, right? Well, by the same token, in the in pre-Columbian Mexico, if you saw the figure on the right, right here, the, uh, the Jaguar warrior, you knew that your days have come to an end because these are the special forces of the Aztec uh, army, right? So this is what I mean by transcultural representation and transtemporal representation of power and superiority. At the same time, unfortunately, uh, the Jaguar represents a major challenge when you, uh, when you face development or what we call development today, that after this pandemic, we're gonna have to change the concept of development for sure. Uh, but uh, uh, people who want to build a hotel or build any kind of infrastructure from a bridge to a road to, to any other uh, dam, or whatever thing, uh, it's always, uh, they have to take into account whether there are Jaguars in the area. And if there are Jaguars in the area, then they, they get hurdles and they see the Jaguar as a hurdle more rather than a transcultural uh, uh, representation of superiority and power. Um, in 2002, we published a, a book uh, looking at the uh, diagnostic analysis of what was the situation of Jaguars at that point in time across the continent. And in that time, uh, the, the distribution of Jaguars was pretty much continuous from northern Mexico up here all the way to northern Argentina down here. There were maybe two or three populations and that was it. We knew nothing on whether there were any Jaguars in the central Amazonian uh, basin. We knew nothing about the south, about the Pantanal or anything. And this is only in 2002. And then in 2017, we, we published this other book uh, looking again at the diagnostics of what was the situation of Jaguars at, the, at that time. And unfortunately, we saw that in those only, what, uh, 15 years, uh, the th two or three subpopulations of Jaguars had become 32 subpopulations. And from those 32 subpopulations, if you... Um, uh, IUCN criteria to each and every one of those 32 subpopulations, you come up with this classification, 30, uh, 31 of those 32 are either endangered or critically endangered. All the orange ones are, and red ones are either endangered or critically endangered, and there's only one, one that is least concerned, and that is the one in the Amazon. Uh, I am part of the CAT specialist group as well in IUCN, and I went to them and I said, I think we need to reclassify the Jaguar. At that point in time, it was near threatened, which, which according to IUCN is not uh, an extinction risk. Uh, uh, and they said, no, 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 no. According to the numbers, we are safe, we're good. I said, well, this all uh, e equates to putting all your eggs in one basket, because the fact that this one population in the Amazon is fine, me, and, and, and if we focus on that fact to preserve the species, well, that will mean that we will lose the rest of the population, the rest of the species range to the north and to the south of the, of the Amazon uh, population. That is not right. Well, to give, to, to, to give you a long story short, Unfortunately, IUCN con continues to uh, classify the jaguar as near uh, threatened, even when the leopard, which has a wider range and can be more abundant and can sustain uh, human encroachment because there's leopards living in cities in many places in Asia and Africa, uh, has been classified to vulnerable. So we are, uh, we are uh, relentlessly paying attention to that and putting pressure on IUCN to reclassify the species. Okay, but in terms of Mexico, uh, that gave us the platform to, to implement the National Jaguar Project. And this is back in 2005, 2000, 2006, with uh, hand in hand with the federal government of Mexico, the, uh, the Secretary of the Environment, basically, uh, uh, we put together this National Jaguar Project to ensure the future of viable Jaguar populations with a number of lines of actions. And I'm going to only talk about a few of those lines of action. 
in 2006, uh, the dream of basically every, every conservation professional, I think, came true to me. Basically, I had the chance to have a meeting with one of the wealthiest men on, in the world, Mr. Carlos Slim, who happens to like Jaguars. He, uh, um, uh, he breeds Jaguars in captivity. He wants to help Jaguars, etc. So I put on his table the idea that Mexico could be the first country in the world to have a nationwide estimate of how many Jaguars do we have. At that point in time, we already had uh, uh, secured the funds from the federal government of Mexico for 50% of the costs to do a standardized replicable method to evaluate and monitor Jaguar populations. But we needed the other 50%. And he actually uh, agreed to support those efforts. And since then, he has been very supportive of everything that we have been doing uh, in terms of Jaguars. Uh, one of the most difficult things that I have ever done in my life is to come together with the 50 or so uh, Jaguar specialists in Mexico in one room and try to come up with a standardized replicable method. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I seriously don't know what it is. With people who work on big cats or big whales or big apes, but they all have huge egos. And because they have huge egos, usually they are right and by definition you are wrong so we spent four of the five days of the meeting trying to come up with a consensus and everyone had their own idea of what the replicable method would be and they did not want to uh, yield to the idea of having a, a, a standardized protocol that everyone would apply in the same way uh, it was many, uh, many attempts, and finally I was successful in the last afternoon saying, listen, if we really want to be uh, a step forward in Mexico for conservation of Jaguars, we have all of us, we have to flexibilize our positions and come up with a common standardized replicable method, which is what we did finally. You can see the graphical the, the representation of the protocol here. It, it's about a hundred square kilometer plot in which we have uh, uh, selected three by three square plots all across the, the, the entire plot. And in those three by three square plots, we have three uh, um, camera trap stations, three camera trap stations in each three by three plot. You put the three camera trap stations uh, opportunistically in the place that you think is the best, have the best chances to represent the Jaguar. And then in addition to that, we have that little square, which is about 600 meters by 100 meters, in which we are documenting the relative abundance of the Jaguar prey. So that is the actual basic uh, protocol that we came up with. And, and then we uh, selected the first, for the first round, of Sen Jaguar, what we call Sen Jaguar National Jaguar Census, the, the blue circles here with numbers, one, two, three, four, five to eight. And, uh, and then in the second one, we did the yellow circles there. As you can see, between the yellow and the blues, we're covering most of the range of the Jaguar in Mexico. So with that, uh, some of the results that we got were, uh, yes, we did find several minimum viable populations across the country and surprisingly large populations in regions that we never expected to have big populations of jaguars like in northern mexico from sonora to tamaulipas but of course the largest populations in the maya are in the mayan rainforest of chiapas and campeche and quintana roo that are connected to guatemala and belize that's the largest populations in mexico and north of the isthmus of panama so the estimated number of Jaguars in Mexico today is about 3,800 Jaguars, which is a big, uh, a big sigh of relief, right? Well, I have to tell you that without any basis, I don't have any basis, but I'm gonna tell you that I, I estimate that those 3,800 Jaguars are really about 20% of the Jaguars that were there 60 years ago. So we have lost already 80%. We cannot lose one more Jaguar. So 
we kept going. And of course, we, we identified what are the key threats that affect the Jaguars. And of course, you all know that most of the threats have to do with, uh, with what I call the revenge of, uh, of a cattle rancher. Basically, uh, cattle ranchers find that Jaguars are attacking their, uh, their cattle. Of course, after they themselves have removed the original prey, the deer, the peccary, et cetera, because they want to eat them as well. And they never even think twice about, uh, about taking that animal that is affecting their interest. So then we, we, we took another step forward with the federal government of Mexico again, and we put together this protocol of attention to conflicts with wild cats by, by cattle depredation. In this, is that okay, Alitris, are you seeing the? the I am, yeah. Uh, okay, all right, great. Okay, so <laughs> this is basically the philosophy underlying this uh, conflict uh, attention uh, with, with jaguars and other cats. You monitor the populations of jaguars and their prey in the area that is going to be subjected to, to that, uh, to that um, uh, process of uh, conflict, conflict resolution. But if I, in a year's time, the prey populations in your land go down for causes that can be attributed to hunting, of course, the only option for the jaguars is to hunt cattle. So if your prey populations go down, we're not going to pay your losses for your losses. If you lost three or four um, calves to jaguar depredation, we're not going to cover them because it was your uh, responsibility to stop killing the local prey, the, the, the wild prey. At the same time, we're educating the, the cattle ranchers so that um, they synchronize their uh, their cows to have to calf the about in, within the same expanse of two to three months, and of course jaguars are not powerful enough to prey on an adult cow, so they basically take the calves that are below two hundred or three hundred kilos, and that is about four months of age. So. Basically, if we save those calves for the first four months of their age, we have saved them the window of uh, predation by jaguars. Uh, at the same time, we also uh, are helping them to herd the cows back when they have the calves, herd them back into a stable and, and keep them there to, pre to prevent uh, further uh, jaguar killings. And of course, the other thing that we're doing is that any individual who's killing a jaguar will respond to the authorities regardless of the status. In Mexico and many other countries, killing a jaguar is a federal offense, but it's not a serious crime. And we are, in the current legislation, we are working with senators to change uh, that so that it becomes a serious crime. And if it becomes a serious crime, it go it's going to trigger the automatic prosecution of that uh, of that uh, crime. Right now, if you if 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 somebody kills a jaguar, if you don't go to the authorities and denounce and accuse that person, nothing happens. But if we make it into a serious crime, then that will happen. And, and we have a very good support of much of the Senate right now. And let's go to the field for a moment and and show you what what else we've been doing in terms of protecting additional uh, areas for the conservation of jaguars. You're looking at, this, at the Mayan rainforest, the south, of, the south of Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula right here, and you can see the massif of tropical rainforest here, which is the biggest one north of the Panama Isthmus. All right, so we are gonna focus in this area down here, which is the Lacandon rainforest, the, my, one of my main study sites. And there you can see that there's a lot of forest still, even outside the protected areas. The protected areas have these red polygons all over the place, but there's a lot of other rainforest out there that is not, uh, is not included in the protected areas. So here what we do is capture jaguars, uh, put GPS radio colors on them, uh, that fixes every five hours. And we are going to basically ask our boss, which is the jaguar, ask our boss, what, our boss what would be the other areas that we need to protect in order to secure the genetic connectivity and the, um, 
uh, the, 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 the probability that that population stays uh, viable for the future. All right, so with that, then I, for, for purposes of simplification, I have only four jaguars here, two males in blue and two females in red. I want you to please focus on this dark blue jaguar and please look at this river that is going down here. That is the Usumacinta River, which is the biggest river in Mexico and the one that divides Mexico from Guatemala. So this is Guatemala and this is Mexico. And look at this jaguar. This jaguar is swimming pretty much every three to four weeks. He swims across the one kilometer wide Usumacinta River into Guatemala to visit his Guatemalan girlfriend. And then three or four weeks later, he comes back to Mexico to be with his Mexican girlfriend so that she is not going to be upset, okay? This is exactly the kind of uh, uh, genetic connectivity that we need to secure for the future of the jaguar in the Mayan rainforest. So with that information, we put together the proposal to the government to create a new protected area in what is called the Sierra de la Cojolita, which is connecting the Lacandon rainforest on this side with the Guatemalan rainforest of the Petén down here. This is being considered by the federal government right now, but I have to tell you that this federal government of Mexico right now has probably even less, if that is poss possible, probably has even less interest in the environment than the Trump administration, which is a lot to say, I know, but we have not made any progress in that front. Um, so the next 50 years will certainly seal the fate of the Jaguar. The law must be applied to its fullest extent. We have to have the political will, and that's what we're struggling with right now. Uh, we need a lot of public education, and please follow our, our uh, uh, social media yeah, because in only one month more, yeah, one more month, we are going to have a really interesting and, and exciting example of reaching out to the Mexican public. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler here. It, in, it involves our 100 peso bill that is going to be released next, next month. I'll, I'll, I'll put that in the, in the media later. We are also in the process of strengthening the cattle insurance, increasing the payments that we give for the, uh, for the calves that were lost. And we need to incorporate lessons from other carnivores because we don't know enough about jaguars and they know a lot about leopards, for example, and we can extract uh, lessons from there. So we have signed an agreement with the Kenya Wildlife Service to see what are they doing for conservation of leopards out there that is working so well there and it's not working so well for the jaguars in Mexico. Uh, we still have to do a lot of research and management and conservation, but, uh, but the process is ongoing and we have been able to implement a number of activities for the conservation of jaguars at the, at the country level. Let's move on to the bighorn sheep. This is, uh, this is an animal that, of course, we share with Canada and the United States. Uh, what you see here is the original range of the bighorn sheep in red all the way down here. We used to have them in six states of Mexico. But then, as of 60 years ago, we lost them from three of these six states. We lost them from Chihuahua. We lost them from Coahuila. We lost them from Nuevo León. And the only place for, by the year 2000, the only place where you could find bighorn in Mexico would be the Baja Peninsula and the state of Sonora. And this island here, that is Tiburon Island, the biggest island in, in, in Mexico. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Tiburon Island in this next segment of the talk. Uh, in, a previous, in a previous life, I was head of the wildlife department in Mexico in the 90s. And one of the first things that I did, I, I came into the administration in 1994, um, uh, was to do a survey of, uh, of bighorn in wherever they were uh, present. We had at that time about a, a thousand in Baja Sur, 2,000 in Baja Norte, about 2,200 in Sonora, and about 600 in Tiburón. All of these, all of these numbers are fragmented and splintered into small populations, no bigger than 100. This is the biggest population in Tiburón with 600 animals. All right, so that's Tiburón Island right there, 
50 kilometers long, about 20 to 30 kilometers wide, very, very close to the mainland, as you can see here. Uh, there is Pico Johnson right there, which is important because in 1975, the Mexican federal government saw that we were losing bighorn all over the country. So they went to Pico Johnson right here, trapped 16 animals and uh, translocated them to Tiburon Island, which had no, at the time, didn't have historical evidence that there were bighorn there. But the, 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 the ecosystem is exactly the same. The habitat is exactly the same. All right, so they, they put 16 animals there and then, and then forgot about them. Uh, then, then we had the perfect conditions to, to run a population growth model because we knew exactly the moment and the number of the initial population, which is 1975, 16 animals there. And then there was an attempt of a land-based census that is not very, uh, very accurate for Bighorn in the 80s. And then we started doing uh, helicopter surveys from 1995 on, we keep doing those, uh, those surveys. With that information, we were able to put together the logistic e uh, equation for population growth and calculate little r, the intrinsic rate of natural increase. And guess what? That value of 0 0.3 is the largest uh, value of any bighorn population in terms of population increase. And of course, that is obvious because the, the, the island had absolutely no predators and no competitors. So the, the, uh, the bighorn were put in an area that was absolutely wonderful for them. It was an Eden for them. Uh, here comes the SETI or CONCAC indigenous group. Uh, the vast majority of the Mexican islands are owned by the nation. They don't have particular donors, private uh, private owners, I'm sorry. Uh, except that in the case of Tiburon, President uh, Luis Echeverria in the 70s gave the SETI or CONCAC indigenous group the title of ownership to Tiburon Island. So it belongs to them. All right. At the same time, the SETI or CONCAC people are uh, in very serious problems. There's about 800 SETIs left of which 40% are diabetic, 40% are diabetic. They have a life expectancy of about 50 years. And when they're 40, many of them have lost their eyesight. Uh, there's quite a significant level of uh, drug use in the, in the youth. And I don't even want to start uh, telling you the terrible tragedies that we're seeing with this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, on the cities, but we are helping them uh, to, to navigate these turbulent waters that we're all navigating. So I went to talk to the city people uh, and suggested the creation of this program for management and conservation of big ship in Tiburon Island. Uh, we traveled to the nearest city, which is uh, uh, Hermosillo in the state of Sonora, with the SETI chief, his assistant, and 12 other SETI elders that conform the trustees of the SETI Trust Fund. It's an interinstitutional, international, intersectoral collaboration. And then I got in touch with an organization called FNOS, which is the Foundation for the North American Wild Sheep. And I said, would you be interested in, uh, in, in auctioning the first ever two hunting tags, two hunting tags out of 600 animals, two hunting tags for bighorn sheep in Tiburon Island. They immediately said, yes, I, I said, there is one catch here, which is that 100% of the money, every last penny is going directly to the SETI Trust Fund, which is this, uh, this uh, bank account in which for any amount to leave the account, 14 series, all of the elders and the chief and his assistant need to sign the check. So it's 14 signatures. This is for transparency and accountability. So think for, uh, for a second, if you were a hunter, how much would you be willing to bid for the first permit ever in Tiburon Island 
to, to come and hunt with the, with the SETIs there. Well, uh, long story short again, the first permit auction in $200,000. And the second one went for $195,000. So in one year, the SETIs got $395,000. There was a big boost. And it was not a, a hand-me-down from the government. It was the result of their commitment for conservation of their island. From then on, there's absolutely zero poaching in the island. And they continue to receive in the order of a, about $100,000 per permit. They continue to auction two permits a year and only two permits a year. Uh, the circle is closed. Conservation is paying for itself. The city are finally getting resources for their community development program. Uh, uh, the, the, their economic diversification is being promoted. And it's also the first time in the last 400 years that the range of the Bitcoin sheep is expanding. I'm going to show you in a, in a moment where we're putting those animals. Uh, but there's still a lot more research that is going on for the purpose of uh, strengthening the program of biodiversity conservation in the island of Tiburon. Uh, what you're seeing here is this man on the left, he paid $195,000 the first time. So the next time, the next auction, I talked to him. I said, would you be willing to, to speak a little bit, to talk about your adventure in Tiburon? How did we treat you? What's the condition of the island? What are the accommodation like? Uh, what was like to hunt with the cities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He said, no. I am not going to talk. I said, whoa, did we treat you badly? Did you have a bad experience? He said, absolutely not. I absolutely love the experience. And because I love the experience, I am not going to talk because if I talk, then the price is going to go up and I want to go again. And I don't want to pay more. So he paid $100,000 that year and he killed the animal that you're seeing here, which is to this day, the world record of a bighorn, desert bighorn sheep killed with a bow and arrow. So good hunts and good conservation are promoting the project more and more. There's a lot of interest in the project and the cities are getting the training and they are collaborating. There you see two members of my team and the entire city team um, uh, that, that have been completely committed to, to, to bighorn conservation and to the recovery of the, uh, the, the desert there. Among other things, well, I'll tell you in a minute, but there is this guy, this one, one of the cities with an antenna uh, following the movements of one of the, uh, one of the big ones that we put a radio collar on. Uh, there's my students doing uh, uh, vegetation surveys with the city people. Uh, and we are expanding, like I said, the bighorn range. Again, this is 2000 and uh, in 2000, it was the situation like that. By 2005, we have established one population in, in Chihuahua, one population in Sonora. These two have already begun to be harvested. Last year, they celebrated their first hunt, one, one bighorn each, ta each time, uh, and, and the population continues to expand. So, so we are recovering the, the population area. At this point, then the bighorn are clearly having their oops, having their uh, their their faith in their hands. It's they who decide that they want to protect the the, the island. Uh, unfortunately, of course, as you probably know, in all of the southwest of the United States and the Sonoran Desert and many other areas, we have uh, um, uh, this 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 uh, grass. Um, buffalo grass that has been destroying large expanses of Sonoran Desert. Well, we gave them a talk about the about buffalo grass, and they decided on their own to go every year, and they continue to do that every year, year after year, to go and by hand pull out any buffalo grass that they find in the very extensive and significant uh, Tiburon Island, uh, Sonoran Desert. So. The Sonoran Desert at this point in time is the most pristine uh, Sonoran Desert that we have left. All right, let's uh, move on to the next one, which is the lesser long nose bats. And you can see that is the star of the show. Um, it's completely covered with pollen after having been 
uh, having been visiting uh, the, the flowers of uh, columnar cacti. This is a species that was listed in the United States in 1988 as an endangered species, listed in Mexico by us in 1993 as a threatened species. It's a migratory pollinator. We, cr we started, I drafted the recovery plan, and we started the recovery actions promptly in 1994. Uh, the, the recovery actions, and this is one of the big lessons that I have extracted along my life, is that uh, you have to have these three elements, research, environmental education, and conservation actions, interacting with each other uh, like that. So the research is providing the basic information that you need to implement conservation actions and also to provide environmental education elements to the local communities. But then the environmental education programs come back with additional questions that feed and that fertilize the research. And we continue expanding in those lines about what people want to know about this animal. What are their curiosities or their concerns about these animals in their in their landscape and likewise the conservation actions are in, are instructing us on what to do next in both research and environmental education so this three-pronged strategy going in every way has been a very effective way of implementing conservation in many many areas not only bats how how do we do this we survey uh the biggest uh, the biggest uh, colonies of this species with infrared video and infrared lights that you see here, these are two infrared lights. And let me show you, this is, a, this is one of the biggest caves of the species. This is in the north of Mexico, very close to the Mexico-US border. I call this, this photo the arrival. And I want to call your attention to the bellies of these. These are all pregnant females that have travel that have migrated over 1200 kilometers from central and southern Mexico to arrive in this cave which is the biggest maternity colony for the species. When, when, when you compile all of the information that we have from the 13 largest roosts of this species that are known anywhere, uh, you see this, uh, this composite. So this is basically 25 years of research compressed into one single slide. Uh, the, the, the caliber and the color of the arrows is telling you the order of magnitude of the numbers of bats in that particular colony. So for example, the pink ones have thousands of bats, the red ones have tens of thousands of bats, and the only uh, purple color has hundreds of thousands of bats. In addition, you can see here the, the number, estimated number of bats in each of those. And at the same time, you have the variance there. And the variance is pretty stable in pretty much every last colony, except in a few, like this one that sometimes has 1,500, sometimes has 80,000. Uh, and also here, this one colony right here taught me a big lesson because this, this cave, it's called Las Vegas Cave. And it turns out that that cave, I got to know that cave when I was 15 or 16 years old. And since then, I've been going back to that cave because that is the one cave in the American continent with the largest number of species of bats. It had, up until about five years ago, six years ago, it had 13 species of bats living in that cave. Well. Six years ago, I sent my students to do the survey there, and they come back uh, reporting that they saw a colony of lesser known of bats. And I get furious, and I go, oh my God, you have no idea what you're looking at. Please go back and hit the books and learn what a lesser known of bat really looks like. And then go back and tell me what is that species that you saw? And they were very sheepish, saying, Dr. Medellin, they are less alone as bats. I said, it's been 40 years that I've been going to that cave. I've never seen a less alone as bat there. But we're going to go over the weekend. And if it's not less alone as bats, then you're in trouble. Well, guess what? 
here I go, eating my words one by one, because all of a sudden, after 40 years of nothing, we have a 4,000 lesser long nosed bat colony in that colony, and therefore 14 species. So uh, it's a lot to learn about species of bats, but basically here we have the evidence that there's new colonies being established. All right. So let's talk a little bit about a recent element that happened in the Pinacate Sonora. That is that same cave that I showed you the picture uh, from the inside of the cave looking out. Now that's the cave of the, the, the mouth of the cave from outside looking in. That is the biggest cave. And what you see here is the largest known colony of Latonicteris Yevabuene. It stays like that for three to four hours, three to four hours you have to remember that these are all pregnant or lactating females. The males stay behind. The males of this species and many other species of bats do not migrate. But every year I need to gauge the reproductive success of that particular colony and many others. So I cannot go inside during the day because I would create a major chaos in the worrying females that would see the light and hear the noises and and, uh, and the movement and everything, and they would drop the baby. So we have to wait until the last female has left around midnight, more or less. And then I go in and gauge the reproductive success. And this is what I find. This is basically a carpet of baby lesser long nosed bats, about two to three days old. The females are very heavily synchronized and all of the babies are born in the first two weeks of May. All right, so for a second now, think that you are one of those females that you left your baby in daycare and went to work, right? And then you're coming back to this nightmare. How are you going to find your baby in that sea of babies? So that was the next question that we asked. So in this next video, I want you to focus on this particular baby right here. When the video starts, all of the babies are peaceful and quiet and nothing is going on. They're not uh, rushed for anything. They're, some of them are stretching their wings, etc. And this baby is also just peaceful there. But then about one or two seconds after the video starts, this baby starts getting very restless, very restless because he knows that mom is back, that finally mom is back and that he's out of that hell hole. So, uh, so the mother comes in from this side of the screen and she starts sniffing and took talk and looking at, uh, at, at every baby to see which one is hers. Uh, we, we are under, trying to understand what are the clues that mothers and babies get from each other to, uh, to identify each other. And um, we're still not sure. We know that the, that the mothers are, are using smell, as you will see, but she's also doing something else. So here we go. It's starting, everything peaceful. And then, oh my God, my mom is here. I'm out of this hell, finally. And the mother is coming and she's smelling, smelling, smelling. Babies, wait a minute. I'm not sure if that's you. Wait, 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 I'm not sure. The baby is absolutely certain that that is his mother. And then the mother does something with a snout. Look at the tongue flicking in and out. Look at that. She's flicking in and out the tongue and she's going down to the geni genitals of the baby. I don't know if she's testing the urine or how, how is she making double sure that that is her baby. Finally, she realizes that's her baby, lets her laugh on the nipple and then there she goes with the baby. We have hours and hours and hours of this behavior and we are uh, analyzing to understand what are the key clues that the babies are getting that the mother's back. All right. When you have a, a population of hundreds of thousands of bats uh, in the Sonoran Desert, you would expect huge expanses of heavily covered uh, saguaros and other columnar cacti. And instead, when you get out of the cave, this is the landscape. There's one saguaro here, one saguaro here, one here, one here, and that's all you see. That is all you see. Whereas if you have uh, hundreds of thousands of bats, the landscape should look like this, right? Okay, so then 
Uh, this is all happening. I, the next question is, where are they eating? This is all happening in extreme northern Mexico, right there in that uh, in that circle, right there. It's in a protected area called the Pinacate Desert. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> El Pinacate Desert, extreme northwestern Sonora, and <clears throat> that's a volcanic shield. The the roost is in the lower southern end of the volcanic shield. This is the volcanic shield, and this is the southern end right here. That is where the, uh, the cave is. Now, the closest saguaro forest, the columna cactus forest is here. And the second closest saguaro cactus forest is all the way here. The distances are 40 kilometers to the north and 50 kilometers to the northeast. Are these 25 to 30 gram bats that are lactating females going to be able to negotiate those distances? Well, here comes collaboration. This is Dr. Yossi Yavo from the University of Tel Aviv, who came up with this tiny, tiny, tiny miniature DHF telemetry radio with a GPS unit on it, with an ultrasonic microphone and recorder on board of the bat, all weighing about 1.6 grams, so about maybe 5% of the weight of the bat. And then we released them. And we started following their movements, and guess what? Of course, they're moving 65 kilometers and a lot more. This is the Mexico-US border right here. This is where that wall is, and the bats are going over the wall. Please tell that to Mr. Trump. He needs to make the wall bigger if he doesn't want the bats to come across and pollinate their saguaros right there, all right? But the 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 average speed for these bats is 30 kilometers an hour and they are meters above the ground until they reach their feet right here. All right, um, so they're going really, really far. It's 65 kilometers just to the Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife Refuge where they have a big concentration of saguaros right there. And then 130 kilometers down here and the bats are coming back every night because they have to feed their babies. Uh, the next uh, lesson that we learned is with these, uh, with these GPS units, we were able to follow the movements of individual animals visiting in individual cacti. So each circle that you see there, except for the red one, each circle is a cactus. The, the gray circles are cactuses that were not visited by this particular bat. The, red, the green cactuses are the cactuses that were visited by this particular bat. And when the video starts, you will see how the bat is focusing, is concentrating on only a handful, maybe five or six columnar cacti. And the others, he, he, she's just visiting them once or twice on the course of the night. So here we go. Oh no, oh no. Let me see if I can get you the uh where would it be where would it be i'm sorry for this da, 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 da. maybe here this is the spanish version of the same talk i'm hopeful that i can go there quickly oops yeah i hope that i can show you the video yeah this is the video so there the movement is starting, the bat is visiting the different cacti, left and right, up and down, Parker, north and south, east to west. Sorry? Oh, we're not, we're not seeing it. Oh, you're not seeing it? Hold on. Uh, what are you seeing right now, We're still Alitris? seeing the same original talk. You're still seeing the original talk. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to start again. Oops. I'm going to start sharing again uh, this one. And I think, are you seeing that slide? Oh no, hold on. Uh, which one is it then? It's this one, okay. Are you are you seeing what I'm doing here? We are still seeing. Okay, so there, 
you're seeing now the video of the bat moving from one cactus to the next. No, no, not yet. And not yet. Little by little. You're not. No, we're still seeing the, the preview. Are you seeing it? No, we're still seeing the, the previous uh, PowerPoint. Did I lose you? So you're not seeing it, Alitris? No, I'm still seeing the previous PowerPoint. Oh my God, I don't know why. Let me see. I'm going to try one last thing. I'm going to copy this. And if not, I'm going to have to move on because we're running out of time. So uh, da -ba -da -ba -ba -da. right here. And... Okay. Are you seeing it now? We are now, yes. Okay, finally. All right, it worked. So there you see the movements of the bats and uh, the one bat and it's uh, the, the pattern is emerging that she is really focusing on only a handful of the, of the cactuses. Our plan for this year, of course, was to identify what is it that makes those bats to focus on those specific individual cacti uh, if they have greater concentration of sugars, a greater amount of nectar, what is it? But of course, the pandemic got in the way. All right, uh, all this information is pointing at recovery. Mexico contains 80% of the species range, 20 years of work, so stability of growth of all populations, including new colonies, uh, where we have legal and real uh, protection of the rules because of the environmental education program. Education has taken root and is growing very strong. In fact, I have to tell you, you probably, knew, you probably know by now that bats have absolutely nothing to do with this pandemic, despite whatever my former friend Peter Daza continues to say, he just said it in the Senate yesterday, uh, that is absolutely not true. But that had triggered uh, killing bats in many countries in the world, but I have to tell you that Mexico is not one of those countries. In Mexico, people have not killed bats. Um, all right, so in October 21st of 2013, we celebrated the uh, uh, the deletion, the removal of that species from the Mexican species of endangered, Mexican list of endangered species. And of course, you know, good, good, uh, good, good news in conservation are unfortunately very rare and far between. But in this case, the good news spread like fire all over the world. We got the media from all over celebrating that for a 20 years time, the species recovered. The delisting has already occurred. We owe it to the donors, the species, to, and ourselves. Let's move to the final piece of the, of the talk about agaves. Those are the, what you call the century plants in the genus agave. Uh, the genus agave is one of the most uh, species-rich gen genera of plants. It has about 220 species. Mexico has more species of agaves than any other country in the world. We have 180 species. Basically, the general, the natural history of agaves is that they grow and accumulate sugar and grow and accumulate sugar and grow and accumulate sugar with the intent of having sex once in their lives and invest every last ounce of those sugars in one single sexual reproductive event. They grow these huge columns called inflorescences here and then they open their arms and offer their nectar to their main pollinators, which are these lesser long nosed bats. So just look at this. Think for a second that you're gonna have sex once in your lifetime. So of course you're investing all of your energy into this humongous uh, reproductive organ. Basically we're looking at a huge penis here of the agaves and compare the asexual part of the plant down here at the base with a sexual reproductive part of the plant. And of course that costs them their lives. An agave flowers one night, one, one, one time, and it spends like a month flowering and then they're dead. That's it. That's the end of the, of the story. So if we can characterize the, the, the interaction, the coevolution between bats and agaves, you could put it like this. Bats are thinking of food, agaves are thinking of sex. And this is what has been driving the way that agaves have become a major part of the Mexican economy. Why is this all important? Tequila, my friends, tequila. 
Tequila comes from those plants. And basically, let me show you some of the statistics of 2014. Close to 1 billion tons of agave heads were harvested, from which about 250 million liters of tequila were produced. The economy of more than 50,000 Mexican families is linked to the tequila production, and tequila sales represented about $2 billion for the Mexican economy. All right. The issue here is that when you are as a tequila producer are replanting your fields, you are using clonal shoots like what this man is carrying here. Instead of allowing the flowers to come up and be pollinated by the bats and use the resulting seeds to replant your fields, you're using clonal shoots. Each, and the tequila agave, agave tequilana, uh, matures at about six to eight years of age. And by that 68 years of age, they have accumulated a huge amount of sugar that the agave, of course, is thinking to invest in their sexual reproduction, but that is denied to them. They are harvested and turned into tequila. And the tequila industry wants to maximize the production of tequila, no matter what cost. So every six to eight years, they have a, a genetic bottleneck. They, let's say that in one hectare, they have about 5,000 plants they use the clones of 250 plants only to replant their fields. So that's a major, uh, major bottleneck right there. We have warned the tequila industry for decades that they had to start investing on the genetic diversity for the future of agaves or else they will risk the future of the plants. Well, they didn't pay much attention. And then in 2010, the disease showed up and then they came back uh, asking, oh, what happened? What happened? What happened? All right. So we started this bat friendly tequila program in which <laughs> if you allow <clears throat> five to 10% of your agaves to flower, that will help, that will feed about hundreds of bats per hectare. The rest of the agaves will be used to produce tequila. And the tequila that is produced like that will become bat friendly and then the National Autonomous University of Mexico and the Tequila Interchange Project, which is a group of tequila producers, restauranteurs, bartenders, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, middlemen uh, decided to, to recognize their efforts by giving them this label that goes on the bottle right there. So in 2016, we launched 300,000 bottles of bat-friendly tequila. If you're interested, and it is available many places in the US and in Canada and in Europe, uh, but not yet in the rest of the world. We're, we're growing slowly, but we are growing. Those are the brands that you, can, uh, that you can identify and look in the local liquor store and, and look online, and you're gonna find it there. All right. So what you're seeing here is nothing short of historical. This is Mr. Salvador Rosales, the owner of one of the tequila companies. And he's seeing for the first time agave flowering shoots in his field because they have not allowed any tequila agaves to flower in over 150 years. Okay, once that happens, then they harvest every last other agaves and they leave that 5% behind. And then my team comes in they set up missions to make sure that the bats are coming and, and visiting the flowers. And sure enough, there's the bats. And sure enough, there's the bat. And sure enough, there's the bats. So we have the circle closed for conservation of this species. Uh, National Geographic gave us the cover a few years ago with this, <coughs> with this love story between tequila and bats. Uh, and again, good conservation stories are uh, rarity in this day and age, so the media around the world took that and, and just promoted it all over the place. Um, just a few words finally on coronavirus and COVID and SARS. Please think that SARS-CoV-2 is a human virus. No animal can give you SARS-CoV-2 regardless of whatever Mr. Peter Daszak can say. He has been saying, by the way, to NPR another big uh, outlets of, of, of news, which I'm surprised because they should verify that, especially NPR. But he has said that if a, if a bat flies by you, 
you might be exposed to the virus. If you live uh, um, with bats in your house, you might be exposed to the virus. And if you go to a cave, you might be exposed to the virus. That is absolute lies. That is absolutely zero evidence for that. And even further, if, the, if, if anybody took that bat SLCOV coronavirus from a bat and tried to put it in a human being, it has 96% similarity. And Peter and other people have said that, uh, that because it has 96% similarity with SARS-CoV-2, then the virus comes from a bat. That is as much as to say that uh, because we share 99% of our genome with chimpanzees, then we come from chimpanzees or chimpanzees come from us. The only thing that we can say is that chimpanzees and us share a common ancestor five million years ago. And by the same token, the bat virus and and the SARS-CoV-2 share a common ancestor, but they're not coming one from another, okay? Furthermore, if you took that virus and put it in your cells, the S protein, which is the one that, that conforms the crown, which is basically the key to open the lock, to enter the cells of the virus that the, that the, uh, that the virus wants to, of, of the host that the virus wants to infect, it wouldn't be possible because the bad virus has the wrong S protein. So it won't infect us at all. Every last human being in the world, except for a handful, has been, uh, has been infected by a human virus, by a human being, not by an animal, all right? So the first line of defense against the next pandemic that is coming regardless, that's the sure, there's more pandemics coming. But the first line of defense against the next pandemic is ecosystem and biodiversity conservation. That's talk about the dilution effect for a little bit of time. Um, the dilution effect basically says that you have a forest that is completely pristine and intact, and you have the whole complement of plants and animals there and their pathogens. The pathogens are there, but everything is diluted. They live all in low density, but then humans come and disturb and deforest and remove and simplify the, 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 the ecosystem, and they make things easy for opportunistic species, in this case, I'm using the, the example of Lyme disease. Uh, but the dilution effect has been demonstrated in many cases for many different pathogens that affect humans and, and affect uh, animals. So if you have a relatively pristine ecosystem, like on the left here, the chances of getting Lyme disease in this human being here, in this Lyme color here, is fairly low, maybe 50%, but, but this, this ecosystem has already been affected. But then when you lose the opossums, the deer, and many other things, then the, the, the uh, uh, deer mice become super abundant, very opportunistic species, and their pathogens become super abundant. And the deer mouse becomes super abundant because they've lost their predators and their competitors. And then the chances of getting Lyme disease are much greater. Well, this is exactly the reason why the first line of defense for the next pandemic is to protect our ecosystems. Okay, I am going to uh, jump through this and go to the recipe to do science and apply it to policy. It's very, very simple. And these are the lessons that I have learned over the past 30 to 40 years. Number one, please get out of your comfort zone. Many academics are enjoying our offices, our field sites, our labs, our classrooms, and we never get out of that beautiful comfort zone. This is exactly the reason why scientists have such a negative name, because nobody knows us. They think that we are these crazy scientists living on the top of a mountain, uh, plotting on how to destroy the world. It's time that we come down from the mountain, get out of our comfort zone and reach out to other sectors of society. Once you do that, you will find that your comfort zone has grown and you will be a lot more comfortable in a month or two months or three months of doing something outside your comfort zone. You are going to find a much greater comfort zone there. That is your signal to get out of that comfort zone and make it even bigger and make it even bigger and never stop, never ever stop to make your comfort zone bigger than before. 
Number two, come down from that ivory tower. You don't know how many academics I know that try to come like Moses out of, uh, of Mount Sinai with the tables, with the commandments and tell the local uh, uh, decision maker or the federal government or whatever, say, oh, I am doctor so-and-so and I'm going to tell you how to fix your problem. That is the perfect way of shutting the door closed in front of your noses. We need to come as just one more human being, one more human being that is coming with all the uh, intent to help in the decision-making process with whatever little things, little tiny little things that we have learned in the process. So please come down from the ivory tower, work the relationship gradually, little by little, gain their trust, win over their friendship even, invite them to the field, work with the other sectors, work with the social uh, sector, with, with the local landowners, with all the NGOs, with everyone, work with every other sector of society. Carry out the research and always keep contact with the other sector. Send them, uh, send them updates from the field. Hey, look at what we found, this is amazing. I hope you can join us next time. It's very important that we really expand our network and really open up to exchanging ideas and learning in the process because we have, have a lot to learn from them as well. Sit down with decision makers. You know, publishing a paper is absolutely nothing. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, um, publishing a paper is not the end. Publishing a paper is not even the beginning of the end. Publishing a paper is the end of the beginning. Once with a paper, you have to sit down with the decision makers, digest the message in your paper, and help them implement the lessons that you learned in that paper into the public policy. That is what we need to do. And I'm sorry, but if you are not part of the solution, then you are part of the problem. Enough of people criticizing this, criticizing that, criticizing the other, criticizing from my government to your government and not doing anything. If we're going to criticize something, we better have something to contribute towards the solution. If we're just going to criticize, we better shut the hell up. All right, and finally, never ever give up. Uh, everything I have said here is of course the result of, a, of an incredible uh, group of people. This is my uh, social media. If you want to uh, follow me, I have a, a YouTube channel where I upload a, a, a three minute long video of a species of bats every, every week and so on and so forth. Uh, this is my team. This is a group of people that actually does everything I have just told you. Uh, it's these people who inspire me and to help me implement this whole thing that we've been doing and many more things that are underway right now. So with that, I'm going to, uh, to stop and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much. Um, Rodrigo has graciously said he would take a few uh, questions or comments. Um, please make sure to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. And if you're having difficulties doing that, please uh, just raise your hand and I can try to unmute you. Uh, let's see. Are there, uh, there's a question on the chat by Dale Steele. Are there any lessons here? Here, if you remain in the Gulf of California, that is a very painful question, and I thank you for that, Dale. Um, we have been we have been uh, pushing and pressing the government to do something. Like I said, this government here is the is the government with the least interest in 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 the environment. But that doesn't mean that it's this government's fault that the vaquita is becoming extinct. And I'm sorry, I am not going to say the vaquita is extinct, even when my friend Lorenzo Rojas, who is the top authority on, on vaquita, tells me that there's less than 10 vaquitas left. I am not going to say that they're extinct until we have absolute proof and evidence that the, the last vaquita has died. Uh, in the process, however, uh, we have been pressing and pushing the government 
to do something to the matter, basically to deploy the personnel there, to dismantle the organized crime that is behind this whole thing. Uh, I am I'm sorry to say that we don't have the key in, we, we know what the key looks like. We know that all we need to do is to stop fishing for Totoaba, the fish for the bladder in the upper Gulf of California. That's, that's what we need to do. That's all we need to do. And the government for the past 40 years, the government has had the task that has been identified 40 years ago to implement alternative fishing gear that is, that is Vaquita safe, and they haven't done anything. And to secure the polygon with strong law enforcement in the area. We've had strong law enforcement off and on in the previous administrations, but this time, starting in December of 2018, absolutely nothing. So there is only NGOs like the Museo de la Ballena from Baja California, La Paz, uh, Diego Rizabio, I don't know if he's uh, watching, but uh, Diego, hello. Uh, he is completely committed to, to the presence of at least some level of surveillance so that, uh, so that if they see uh, fishermen, they change them off out of the polygon. But it's, it's a very heartbreaking process. Uh, I don't have any assurances, unfortunately, to you, Dale. That, uh, that, uh, that the species is going to be uh, saved at this point in time, but we're doing everything we can. Um, do you want to handle the questions, uh, Alitris? Uh, sure, I think um, someone wanted to chime in and ask a, a question. Um, Phantom, was that you? Um, let's see, if we could, um, we had um, a couple questions about um, hunting. And so um, one question is, uh, could you please elaborate on what you said about a good hunt and good conservation? Um, in India, hunting Excellent. is not allowed. Very fair question from Aridi Sharma from India. Um, I am not a hunter. I have to start with that. I'm not a, I cannot put myself behind a rifle and shoot something. That is beyond me. I cannot do that. But I have to tell you that a good hunting program is an excellent Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so I have to say that a, a good conservation, a good uh, hunting program is an excellent conservation tool. There's really no other way that we would have saved the bighorn from the poaching that was going on in Tiburon Island and other areas than to give value. And I believe me, I don't buy the concept of value it, put some dollar value on, on biodiversity or lose it. We, we should be, we should be just uh, uh, enjoying nature as it is by, by definition, by ethics, by whatever other value of biodiversity. But unfortunately, in this day and age that is, everything is monetized, then we have to put a dollar value. And this is exactly what we've been doing. Because the, the Bitcoin has such huge high dollar value, that makes the local communities completely convinced to protect the species and the ecosystem. That means that the population of bighorn has been mushrooming like crazy. We have been had to remove bighorn from the island because we're very close to the carrying capacity, as you saw in my graph. Uh, so a good hunt is a hunt that is within brackets. We know that from 600 animals, two are going to die every year, two. And those two are very old males. The very old males that, that develop the biggest horns, which for whatever reason, I don't even want to know why the, a hunter would be interested in hanging a big set of horns from their wall. I don't know. And I don't care. If they're interested in paying for that, I'm all for it. 
because that is supporting the, 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 the community and it's supporting the community's uh, commitment to protect uh, the Bighorn. That program has been replicated uh, in many areas of the Bighorn uh, range in Baja, but also has been replicated in other species. So right, uh, you know, when I was in the government, I was uh, naive enough to think that the big money maker was a big on sheep. Absolutely not. The big money maker, mark my words, the big money maker is the white winged dove. The white winged dove is giving Mexico, the Mexican economy, a lot more money that is reaching many more hands, many more hands. In terms of the Bitcoin, the money from the Bitcoin is going to the city community, to the Cucapá community, to this community, to that community, and that's it. In terms of the, of the uh, uh, white wing dove, it goes to thousands of families that get a lot less money, but putting all the money together and going to Asia, you probably know about the Marco Polo sheep identity in which the Marco Polo sheep is another example of successful conservation, successful hunting for conservation. Uh, Marco Polo and Marco and many other of the uh, lower Himalayas uh, range that are huge uh, tasks for hunting. And they, they, they are giving a lot of money to the local community. So that's what I mean by good hunts for good conservation. Rodrigo, we've, we've got several questions um, on similar topics, um, but one's from Megan. Um, and you've had uh, just such a successful career, and you truly are you're this great policy um, advocate, and then you're this exceptional you know, ecologist, naturalist. And you know, how do you build a successful conservation career that's truly interdisciplinary? You know, what, what advice do you have um, for, for us? Okay, so I, I thought that I, I had shared my lessons in that last slide. Basically, that is the recipe, uh, uh, Megan. The recipe is to come down from that ivory tower, get out of your comfort zone, and really have the full commitment that your work as a professional is going to turn into a you having an international um, impact like what we are having in our in a convention that it has a bad name but I'm sorry to tell you uh, in another point at, at another time maybe next year Alitris, if you invite me I will give you a seminar on CITES the, interna the, the international convention, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. This is the one, the, the one multilateral environmental agreement that has teeth. It has teeth because it makes the countries get their act together. And if I can go back to Dale's uh, point about, uh, about the Vaquita, it's actually CITES that is putting the biggest pressure on the Mexican federal government. One of the, one of the topics that are on the table of CITES right now is that they may end up closing all of the international trade on all of the CITES listed species for Mexico. That includes the beacon sheep, and it's going to affect my efforts to protect the beacon sheep in Tiburon Island. But if that makes the, the Mexican government react and at least do something to seriously fight for the vaquita. I'm all for it, I'm sorry. And they're gonna see this. And I may disappear later some, someplace in Mexico. But, uh, but seriously, what I'm saying is, you have to, have to open up to all sorts of activities. Get engaged in CITES, for example. My last battle in CITES last, last year was to list the Mako shark in Appendix 2. Mako shark, I'm a mammalogist. What am I doing with Mako shark? Well, conservation, as you probably know, is 80% common sense. So cultivate your common sense. And I work with lots of shark experts 
And we put together that proposal that was extremely successful, extremely strong. And we were fighting against, and I'm not going to name them, against the countries that you all know which, they, which ones they are, that are using the macro shark because of their fins are the biggest uh, quality fins, the second or the third highest quality fins. And we had a major pushback, but we won. We won. By, by, uh, by majority, by votes, but we won. And the proposal has been adopted. And now the macro shark has a much greater level of conservation uh, of protection than it had only a year ago. Uh, okay, another question. I think um, that the, there's kind of a second part to that question to piggyback. Uh, if you could just touch briefly on a lot of us get like kind of a pigeon held into working with one species or one taxa. And you've worked with such an incredible diversity of species and taxa. Um, could you please just maybe touch on, you know, some tips that you have for folks that might want to branch out and work on other species as well? Yeah, absolutely. You never even consider concentrating and centralizing on only just one this my dream of an education in conservation. Here's the Rodrigo Medellin, the nationalistic hothead that I am. All right. You get your undergraduate degree here. I am pointing at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the top Spanish speaking university in the world. University number 79 in the world of more than 5,000 universities, okay? Why? Because if you go there, you are going to learn very little bits and pieces about everything. You are going to know about antocerotales. You're going to, about, you're going to learn about rotiferans. You're going to learn about everything. So you're going to know nothing about everything. And then you go to the US or to Canada or to Europe to get your master's and your PhD. And then you specialize and you know everything about nothing. And then the rest of your life, you cover the rest of the pyramid. This is exactly what happened to me. When I left the country, I was already recognized as one of the experts on bats. I said to myself, my graduate work is not going to be on bats. Mexico cannot afford to have someone as, as specialized as working only on bats. So I went out and I started working on all of the other mammals in the Lacandon rainforest and how the Lacandon Indian way of using the land was affecting all of the other mammals. I did my PhD, I published my papers, I continued to publish papers in that area with jaguars and other things. But then I came back to Mexico saying, now I have the authority to work on bats and on other mammals. So see, there's many ways to, to break the walls of your comfort zone. Please do break the walls of your comfort zone. That's the best advice that I can possibly give you. Yeah. And I would also add to <clears throat> try to look for opportunities to collaborate as well, you know, and, and um, join these collaborative teams. That's Absolutely. Great. Again, the only way uh, that uh, I have been able to do anything is with collaboration. In the case of the bighorn sheep, the collaboration was with a local NGO called Unidos para la Conservación, which is now defunct. And it was also with Arizona Game and Fish Department, which were absolutely amazing. You know, I, at the time, I was not, I'm, I'm not even now, I publish papers on bighorn sheep, but I'm not an expert on bighorn sheep. But at the time I was as close to an expert of bighorn sheep that Mexico had. So I reached out to Arizona Game and Fish Department and they have incredible sheep experts. So they were uh, generous enough to come and train us, to come and do the surveys with us with their helicopter and everything. I got the money from the government to pay for the helicopter, but that collaboration is what became the bighorn program there. By the same token, you saw uh, Yossi Yobo there in the, in the uh, back part of the lecture. And of course, this collaboration is not only the way to solve the issues, 
it's also an incredible way of extending your network with lots and lots of friends. I mean, I am so lucky that I have friends all over the world. I told you that I have projects or students in 14 countries in four continents. And I'm sorry, but I feel at home at each and every one of those countries. And I count myself, you may have seen this in the press, I count myself as one of the happiest people I know. And I continue to be as happy as ever, even with this damn government that is not paying attention to environmental issues. Uh, Rodrigo, would you mind putting up, we had some requests um, to show your recipe slide again while you're answering My it. My recipe? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. The, your final slide, that was just so wonderful. Um, All right, and, sure. Let's see. Uh, and then this is a question from Storms um, that, you know, I'll, I'll add to, um, you know, we're, we're in this, you know, incredible environmental, you know, I guess, yeah. crossroads right now. And, you know, we're, everyone on this planet has been affected in some way by this pandemic, you know, which is caused by our destruction of the environment. And so you would think exactly. that this would be one of the greatest, um, you know, talking points and, and justifications on why we should do more for conservation. But yet we're seeing kind of the opposite effect. Um, can you touch on maybe what we can be doing or what we should be doing more to kind of reach the masses on you know how these big you know environmental disasters, whether it's you know climate change or um, you know pandemics, yeah. are all linked to our relationship with the natural world. Very very good point, Alitris. Uh, this uh, this pandemic is the first really seriously big uh, alarm. Alarm that is being sounded by the by the planet that we're doing things wrong. We we as conservation professionals have a part of the responsibility in changing the the trajectory of the world right now, and we have to start with our own with ourselves. But uh, this, is, this, this pandemic is giving us a big platform to speak out, a big soapbox. And we all... I'm sorry, I, I don't know what's going on. But uh, uh, this is the moment in which we really have to come together as a, as a group and with all humbleness and with all common sense we have to talk to the decision makers and tell them about this thing, about the dilution effect, about biodiversity values, about ecosystem services, about everything that is, that is going down the toilet. I mean, there's people like E.O. Wilson who has been fighting for 50% of the world to be left alone. I, I, I fully support that, but 50% is already gone. We're down to maybe 10%. And if we lose that 10%, this pandemic right now is going to be child's play. We are, we're getting, I mean, when, when really the, the climate change really hits us, oh my God, that is going to be absolutely terrible. It's already terrible for many, uh, many people in the world who are suffering the, the damages already. But it's going to affect all of us. So please think that you guys, even you, even in the United States right now, especially right now because the elections are coming, you guys have something to do in the context of elections. I mean, if this man is reelected, I fear for the US and for the world. So it's, ask yourselves what you guys are doing above and beyond having a pinch of, uh, a, a, a pint of beer and talking about the terrible things that he's doing. 
but what are you guys doing about it? Here, we are doing stuff to remove this man from office, our man, our president. We are talking to people outside, uh, outside our comfort zone, because that's another thing. We always, and here, here I am again, preaching to the choir. All of you are complete converts already. I should be talking to the street people in Mexico. And I have, and I continue to do that. And I'm looking for, for opportunities. In fact, we had a, for whatever reason, I came to, um, uh, I came to meet this actor who appears in Narcos and the Queen of the South. And this guy happens to be interested in making changes. Well, we have 100,000 views of the live that we did in Instagram uh, two weeks ago. That is the kind of, of um, non, uh, non preaching to the choir that we need to do, preaching to the non choir. You think, what non choir could you be preaching to? And preach for crying out loud, preach. It's very important. I'm going to remove the uh, the uh, this thing. Okay, there. And I, and I think I know that we're we're taking up your very valuable time, but um, could you just give maybe one last minute pointer on on how do we do this? You know, if if you were to kind of someone who's never stepped out of that comfort zone and has never you know tried to engage um, folks that aren't already converted. How, how would you do that? Like what, what little kind of one single tip would you give them? Start small. Yeah. Sure. Start small and uh, think getting out of your comfort zone with your neighbor, with the person. And I've done it with my, I, I live in a compound of 14 houses. Some of the people here are not even willing to classify their trash and separate their trash. I go out and talk to them. One time, it was absolute disaster. But another time, they agreed to do that. So start small and keep digging. Do not stop there. Oh, I see Marshall Jones. Hi, Marshall. Um, I, I, uh, I see, you, you will see what are the next steps out of your comfort zone that you can do. And, and just do them. And start with your own self. This is another lecture that I give for the University of Mexico in which you think, all right, so what can I do to lower my, my, my carbon footprint from decreasing the amount of uh, meat that I'm eating to cutting back in the time that I spend in the shower. And I know that we all people, city people, we enjoy our showers and many times we take the showers as a the, as the moment to, to, to meditate and oh my God, it feels so good. I said, well, that is taking resources, valuable resources, not only water, but also energy and many other things from up there in the mountain. So if you don't start by cutting back in water, uh, finding out uh, where, the, where the food is coming from, where, how is your food being produced? My, one of the slides that I skipped was on, on, for example, on chicken. You know that we've had very serious issues with uh, uh, avian flu, and there's more coming. And where's the avian flu coming from? Well, look at those, uh, look at those uh, chicken uh, coops chicken farms. They look seriously like Times Square in New Year's Eve. That's a perfect setting for a new pandemic to grow up. And that is because we are not engaged. We are very comfortable going to the supermarket and buying the chicken bread because I want to do chicken, whatever. All right. Well, we have, we have to get engaged there. So just think of ways in which you can lower your impact and talk about, uh, about that with your friends, not in the conservation arena, but other places. Thank you, Alitis. Yeah, thank the you so much, Rodrigo. This has been absolutely exceptional. Uh, for those of you who are interested, um, we have recorded this, and Rodrigo's um, generously said that I could share that. So 
Um, so if you're interested in um, getting the recording, please uh, contact me. And then please join us uh, next month on the 2nd of September at the same time for our next Wildlife Wednesday. And stay tuned, we'll announce our speaker in two weeks. So exciting things to come and Rodrigo's left some giant shoes to fill. Um, so thank you so much, Rodrigo. This has really been just absolutely wonderful um, beyond expectations and I really appreciate it. And on behalf of everyone, thank you for everything that you do for all of the species of the world, including ourselves. So thank you. Thank you very much, Alitri. It's wonderful to see you all. And let's uh, let's meet on the on the road some other place. Take care okay. of yourselves. Bye bye. Yes. <laughs> thank all you, right. Rodrigo. Thank you very much. <laughs>